Well, good morning, Lake Country. Here we are on week number 16, and it is Father's Day. We are so thankful for all the fathers here at Lake Country, and we want you to know that we continue to pray for you, and, and we have a Heavenly Father who is right there with us as we endeavor to raise our our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Being a dad can be difficult at times, but we have not been left alone. We've been given God's spirit. And so uh, whatever you do, just keep pressing into Jesus, keep pressing into God's word and let God's word be your guide on this adventure uh, we call fatherhood. And so I just wanna say thank you uh, to all of you guys who are continuing to raise your kids the best you know how uh, through the power of Jesus Christ. Uh, I am down at Ocean Shores this week, enjoying some time away with my family. And so that means that Tyler is going to be filling in for me today. Uh, I'm so thankful for Tyler and Jesse and the ministry that they have here at Lake Country. Tyler is the behind the scenes guy that does all the editing of the services that you see every week. And so when you get a chance, be sure to say a big thank you to Tyler for all the work he's put in all of these weeks. And Tyler's really stepped up in this area and we're so grateful to have him here at Lake Country. He's gonna be looking at Psalm chapter number one and I know that you're going to be blessed. Uh, Tyler loves the Word of God. Uh, he loves Jesus, and he's always going to guide us back to Christ through the Scriptures, and so I know you're going to be blessed this morning. Uh, let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the avenue that we, you have given us here. Um, again, we've, we've mentioned this is not ideal, uh, but this is what we have at the moment, and we're thankful that the church has continued to be united uh, through virtual church. We look forward to the day that we can gather in person, and I pray that that would come sooner than later and that you would make a way uh, for us to be able to gather without all the distractions that come with it. Uh, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be a father. I thank you for the fathers at Lake Country. I thank you for all those fathers uh, who have been examples to all of us here at Lake Country over the years. Uh, you've just really done a great work here in our church. And I believe a lot of that has to do with the men of God who have faithfully led their families and led this church over all these years. I pray you would use this service this morning uh, to lift your name high. I pray you'd use the word of God to convict our hearts where we need to be convicted and, where, and you would encourage us where we need to be encouraged. And ultimately, uh, we, would, we would leave this service ready to be your ambassadors to this lost and dying world. And we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. No matter how old we are, we always remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. Nuh-uh. My dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2. 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 My dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dad for all our lives.
Good morning, Lake Country. My name is Tyler Stores, and I'm the youth ministry director here at the church. And um, I have the privilege of opening God's word with you this morning. Micah is um, resting and getting ready for the next sermon series uh, for the church and asked me to fill in just for one week. So I want to say happy Father's Day to all the fathers in our church. Um, I know many of you, and um, I'm so encouraged by your faithfulness, by your example. Um, I pray that God would give you many faithful years and allow you to pass on a love for God, a deep love for God to your children and to your family. That is most important. Um, Your family needs you. You are crucial to your family, and I pray that God will bless you in that way. Today we're talking about Psalm 1, about the rooted person who is rooted in the word. Um, Jesse and I, at our wedding, we decided to do something a little different than like candles and sand for that unity part of the wedding. We like, we, we decided, hey, it might be cool to do a tree instead of candles and stuff and be cool throughout the years we get to see it grow and um, we'll get to watch it get bigger and bigger and it'll be a picture of our marriage. Well, um, let's just say that that wasn't the first plant we killed. And I know it's awful for me to say, but um, we are not a Stacy Taylor or Julie Owen. If you know those two ladies in our church, they have a green thumb like no one else I've seen, and um, they can grow pretty much anything with their eyes closed. And we are not that. I do not claim to be um, a gardener or um, have a green thumb, but I know that God's word tells us we can be like rooted trees, and I want to look at this passage with you today, and I hope that um, we will be more alive than Jesse and I's tree that is not. So, um, we're going to be in Psalm 1. If you don't have your Bible, um, go get it. I know when I'm at home, um, I try to get it as often as I can, so I'm going to give you a second. Go get it now. We're going to be in Psalms. Psalms is a really special book in our Bible because it stands apart from a lot of them. Psalms is a collection of songs. It was Israel's hymn book, and um, this, what makes this an interesting book is that it was written by more than seven authors. Um, predominantly David, King David, wrote many of these songs, and it was written over hundreds of years. So centuries of time has has gone into these songs, and um, the Psalms was written to give uh, us a special sense, a, a special dimension to our understanding of God. And what the Psalms does very well is it gives word to our thoughts and our emotions. Um, much like a physical mirror helps us to see our appearance, the Psalms helps us see our soul. John Calvin said, The Psalms are like an anatomy of the soul because this book expresses every thought and feeling of our experience. And so one thing it does well is that it it helps us to reorient our feelings and to to, um, process our thoughts and to help us funnel and and filter and, and draw us back to God by them. And so in these Psalms we read, we read and we acknowledge and we feel and, we, and we're broken and we're joyful with all of these authors and it helps give word to these feelings in us. And so Psalms serves us well in that way. Now we're gonna be looking at Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is much like the rest of wisdom literature. This Psalm describes two people. In the, in the, throughout, the, throughout the Bible, we have light and darkness. We have um, evil and righteous. Um, we have Cain and Abel, Christ and the Antichrist. We have hot and cold, and we're rebuked for being lukewarm. And here, like other wisdom literature, we have two people, the righteous and the wicked. 
And it doesn't give us a third choice. There is no middle ground, and I know that's hard for us. That is kind of confronting to us because we like middle ground. We like not being one or the other. We like being both, and that's comfortable for us. But there is no biblical third option for us. It confronts us with this reality that we are either living one of these two ways, either a life of righteousness or a life of wickedness. There is no other option. And this first psalm stands at the beginning of all the others, sort of as a, a doorkeeper to all those who come to it with a very basic choice to make before entering. And that's this, what path will you walk? As we will see shortly in Psalm 1, it describes an intimacy with God that only the righteous can experience. And it kind of serves as a warning to all the unrighteous that you cannot have this intimacy unless you forsake your wickedness. And so, the first three verses will explain what that righteous path looks like, and that's kind of what I want to focus in on today. And I want to see with you what it produces in us. Now, I want to make one thing clear before we get started. Scripture, uh, we believe here at Lake Country that Scripture always points to Jesus. That throughout um, any point in the Bible, we can, we can identify and, and see how it points us to uh, Jesus Christ, and we know that this is true because Jesus teaches us this himself in Luke 24. And so we should identify the perfect example of this Psalm 1 person as Jesus first. None of us can or will pursue God perfectly. We can't. No one has. Only one has. And so as we look at these words, the challenge for us today is not that we try to be something we're not, but to try to be more like Jesus. Now, the Old Testament is always pointing towards something greater. We know this. David may not have known Jesus when he wrote this, but he still does point to Jesus, and this is amazing. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And now in Psalm 1, I want to show you how we have the way, the truth, and the life in, in verses 1, 2, and 3. It says first in verse 1, this is the way. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. He says, here's the way. Here's the way to a blessed life. Here's the way to be a blessed man. He says, don't do this. This is not the way. Do not go this way. The man who is blessed does not do these things. This verse is talking about our, the way we think, the way we behave, and the way we belong. It's talking about our thinking, our behaving, and our belonging. There is a path that the rooted person takes, and this is not the way. This is the way of the world. Verse 2, we see the truth. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. This verse tells us that there are two things that the rooted person does. He delights in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. These two things stand in contrast to the walking, standing, and sitting of the world. And the third verse we see the life. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. This verse paints a beautiful picture for us of who the rooted person is and what he looks like. His roots have a steady supply of water. His life bears fruit in its season. It's not premature, it's not too late, it is right in season. His leaf doesn't wither, it says. He doesn't, and when drought comes, when dryness comes, he doesn't become brittle and broken. And it says in all that he does, he prospers. Man, we want that. I want to prosper. I want my family to be happy. I want my work to be successful. We want pros to prosper, right? But we can't just read this line alone. We've got to read around it. We've got to read what's before and after it. And we need to, to choose to do what the rooted person does to get what the rooted person has. So the first thing we know of this rooted person is that the rooted person is blessed. It says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. This word blessed, it means literally, oh, the happiness. And it's plural. And so it's 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 most plainly, blessednesses. That's hard to say, blessednesses. Um, so it's talking about a plentiful, a multiplied, a many blessing, a multiplied blessing. The sequence we see here of this one who is blessed is from walking to standing to sitting. 
and it paints a progression of relatively just first at, at first casual association with the wicked to complete identification with them. And isn't this the way of sin? That sin first starts small. It starts what seems innocent. It starts simple, but it grows and it becomes something much, much bigger, and eventually you are completely identified with it. It's not just an association, it's your identity. So uh, are you following the world or are you following the word? The choice is yours. As I said before, Psalms 1 tells us about this blessed man and it tells us about the wicked man and it gives us these two options because the choice is ours to make. What path will you choose to walk? Are you following the world or the word? You see, your counselors turn into companions who end up being your crew. So what I mean is you need to be careful about who you ask for advice, who you stick around with, because your counselors become your companions and your companions become your crew, and the blessed man does not engage in this way. These three phrases show three degrees of conformity to the world, accepting its device, advice, excuse me, participating in its ways, and then adopting its attitudes. And it specifically marks out this one attitude of scoffer, this one who mocks. And this is the exact opposite. This is um, completely opposite of what it looks like to have an attitude of repentance. So what are we to do? Verse two tells us, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. The rooted person wants God's word. Why does he move from walk, stand, and sit to this alternative of delight? How are these opposites? Why does he do this? I think what David is doing for us in this passage is he's showing us that external activity, activity, excuse me, is opposite of internal activity. So we have a new object of delight. We don't just change by doing different things. We change by changing the, what, what's, what's going on inside. We change by getting a new delight. Whereas once we loved wickedness, we loved serving ourselves, now the blessed person does something different. He chooses to delight in God. That's the difference here. We delight in God, God's word, the law of the Lord. When you delight in something, that's much different than just doing something dutifully. When you delight, you honor it, you treasure it, you live for it. Are you delighting in the world or in the word? This word delight, it means more than just pleasure. It's more than just, like, like Jesse and I made a nice dinner last night. We made this new tilapia recipe. It was delicious, but I couldn't eat that every day. You know, you have it once, you ha maybe have it twice for leftovers, but then you're like, okay, I've had enough. I need something different, right? It's a pleasure that's, that's fleeting, but a delight is something that is more than just a temporary pleasure. It, this word has more to it. It means something of gravity. It's so captivating that it draws you to itself. Delight is something that creates a desire. That's the difference here. At the beginning of Jesse and I's relationship, I remember that, um, we began to begin to know one another, and the more time we got to spend and the more conversations we had, the more I fell in love with her. Um, I remember many of the days that we were dating during our four years before marriage um, was spent over the phone, was spent um, uh, sending packages to one another because I was gone away at college. And the more time we get to spend, I fell in love with this girl. I wanted to spend time with her, and a lot of my life began to sh be shaped differently to, to to free myself up to be with her. And that's kind of how it is w w with us when we delight in the Lord. We begin to shape our life around him. We begin to conform everything else to submit to him. And so our time and so our schedule and our attitude and our thinking and our desires and our gifts, they all belong to him because we delight in him. It's like falling in love. Worship of God is more than knowledge. Worship of God takes our delight. It's about enjoying God. It's about loving God. It's about desiring God. I think this verse is teaching us that compulsive worship is not acceptable to God. We are not robots and slaves. We are people. We have 
desires, and we have love to give, and God desires that from us. It says that we delight in the law of the Lord. The law of the Lord, this original word for law, is Torah, and it means instruction or direction. And so we can take this either to mean strictly one command or um, take it as broadly as all of God's instruction to us. And so that's what I think here, as in other places in the Psalms, um, David means by the law of the Lord. We, we We understand that we ought to delight in all of God's instruction to us, all of God's intentions for us. On the other hand, we know that our ways are destruction. God's ways are given to us for our flourishing, but ours only lead to sin and death and destruction. Proverbs 14, 11 tells us this very thing. The house of the wicked will be destroyed, but the tent of the upright will flourish. There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way to death. God is rightly worshiped when his word is obeyed. This is the only way. He says something more than just delighting. He says, with us, um, he kind of he kind of fills in our thought here. He says, "Okay, so what does this look like? How can I show my delight is in the word?" If you're following along with me, this is maybe a question that you're asking. I, I I want to show my delight. I have this attitude, but what action can I take? He says, "On his law, he meditates day and night." Now, this is this is uh, this poses a problem for us, and I say that because in 2015, <laughs> Time Magazine posted a headline. Brace yourselves for this. Now, uh, you now have a shorter attention span than a goldfish. (laughs) It says, according to a new study from Microsoft, people now have an attention span of eight seconds, down from 12 seconds, and a goldfish having an attention span of nine seconds. That is devastating. (laughs) Um, We also know from uh, a recent study that the average American checks their phone every four minutes. So by now, I'm sure you've checked it three, four, five times. Proverbs 23, seven tells us this, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What has your focus? What has your thoughts? What this verse is telling us, and it's alluding here, is that what shapes your thinking shapes your life. What has your attention? What are you meditating on? What does it mean to meditate? Meditation comes in its most basic form to mean whisper and a low repetition. It's kind of like the, the cooing of a pigeon or the growling of a lion. It's, it's low, it's constant, it's light. If I was asked um, earlier what meditation was, I would have said it's thinking or it's just pondering, it's giving thought to something. But there's more to it. It also means to, to mutter and to speak, to be, to be verbal, to make noise. So combined with the rest of this verse, it says to meditate on the law day and night. We come to understand meditating is filling our minds with the law of the Lord. It is chewing, it is savoring, it is thinking, it is um, serious thought on the law of the Lord, all of God's instruction to us. John Piper says it well. He says, meditating is a serious pondering for the sake of spiritual pleasure. So meditating is delight-driven pondering. So we meditate on it. We have a delight in God's word, but it moves us it affects in us a action, a meditating, a muttering, a returning, a repeating, a delighted pondering. And we have a beautiful picture of what all of this looks like. It says in verse three, he's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither and all that he does, he prospers. What does the rooted person have? It promises us that the rooted person prospers. Now I want you to look at this picture of these trees. I did not take this picture. I did not um, visit this place, but I found this picture, and this is a picture of cypress trees. They're located in Texas. These cypress trees, as you can see, are planted near streams of water in, (laughs) more clearly, in streams of water, right? And every year, these trees undergo a massive flooding. Um, the rain season comes and they get washed and pounded by um, days and, and large, huge amounts of water, right? And they undergo a, a large amount of stress and um, flooding and turmoil and 
one thing remains after the flood, the trees. And we know that because the trees are strong. Why are they strong? These trees aren't strong because of their tops. These trees are strong because they are rooted deeply and intricately and strongly into the soil beneath them. They're rooted and they're um, strong because of the water they've been drinking and feeding on. When the psalm says this person is like a tree, he says he's planted by streams of water. He's illustrating what it looks like for us to delight in God's word. This is what it looks like. We are like trees, trees planted who can undergo floods. We delight in God's word. This is a strong delight. This is not weak The roots of this person are the the delighting. The water that these roots drink is the law of the Lord and all of God's instruction and intentions to us. I want you to look at this picture again and I want to read to you Jeremiah 17. This is a parallel passage to our chapter here, Psalm 1. It says this, Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. He is like a tree planted by water that sends out its roots by the stream and does not fear when, he com- when heat comes, for its leaves remain green and is not anxious in the year of drought, for it does not cease to bear fruit. Church, when you send your roots deep into the streams of God's word, you will prosper. The Bible tells us that you'll bear fruit in season. Throughout scripture, we know that bearing fruit means a life of obedience and good works. These things that we want to be able to do as Christians, we want to be pleasing to the Lord, we want to be faithful to our family, we want to be able to give and to to encourage and to teach and all of these different things we seem we can never have. These fruits in our lives come from our roots, right? We've got to get the first thing first before we get the fruit from it. And it says that we will bear fruit. We will bear fruit. And it says in season, this is God's timing. This is exactly when God intends for us to bear fruit. So stay faithful. It also says that his leaf does not wither. This is telling us that we will endure. When drought, when dryness comes, when summer comes, and life gets hard, when we have adversity and floods, when it seems like there's no clear way forward, that's, that's dryness, that's drought. I just told the students this past week that how I've been feeling. Man, this time, this season has been difficult. It's been difficult not seeing the church. It's, it's left me feeling like there's something missing in my life. I've missed Sunday worship. I've missed Wednesday youth group. I've missed seeing and interacting and, and getting that energy from the students that we get each week, and we haven't had that for weeks on weeks. And that's difficult. That's fatiguing. That's, that's hard on us. When times come like this season, what roots us? What nourishes us? What gives us life? It says that his leaf does not wither. We do not have to fear dryness and drought because we are always connected to the water of life. And it says finally that in all he does, he prospers. Seems kind of unrealistic, right? Seems kind of naive to say that in all he does, he prospers because reality is we, we see the wicked prospering and the people who seem to do right get wrong. And so how could this be true? We've, we've even heard from this pulpit of the prosperity gospel, this evil gospel that tells us that if you give, God will multiply and make you rich. God will heal you of all your disease. And it's, it's a me first gospel. How do we understand this sentence? What are we to mean, take of this and of its meaning? I think there's three verses that help us to understand from the New Testament this idea of prospering and how we are to to tame this seemingly wild claim. It says in Romans 8, 32 through 37, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is it? Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is in, in, indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? These things are not pros- prospering things. This is suffering. This is evil. This is, n- n- this is far from prospering. Verse 36, for your sake, we're being killed all the day long. We're regarded as sheep for the slaughter. He says, no, 
in all these things. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So I see in this verse that there is a prospering. He calls us more than conquerors through Christ. Even in all of these things, the hardest of what the world can give to us, even death itself, there is a prospering even in our affliction. Christ makes us more than conquerors through him. God does not spare anything for us because he freely has already given us the greatest thing himself, his own son. Another verse comes to mind, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 58. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Your labor is not in vain. Along with this one, Ephesians 6, 8, knowing that whatever good anyone does, whatever labor anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he's a, bond, a bondservant or is free. Your labor is not in vain. How could we say that differently? We could say it positively. Your labor will prosper. This is God's promise to us. How can we sum this up? Everything he does, this blessed man, when he's rooted in God's word, delighting and meditating on it, everything he does is going to work for his good, and in the end, everything will be rewarded from the Lord, and nothing will be in vain. Your work is not in vain. There is a prospering even in the difficulty. There is a prospering even in our lives of, progressively, uh, of progressive sanctification. We are always being more like Jesus. We're going to make mistakes. We are real people. We, 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 we are not perfect. But in our imperfection, God is blessing us, looking after us, and making our labor to prosper. Church, to be deeply rooted is to make a choice. We must choose to delight in the Lord. We bring ourselves regularly to God's word. This is what it means to be deeply rooted. Find ways to meditate on the word throughout your day, speaking it to yourself, rehearsing it to yourself, drinking it in, rooting yourself into it. In doing so, we're doing something else. In doing this one action, we're forsaking another. We're letting the world pass by. We're forsaking it. We're forgetting about it. And we're choosing to bring ourselves to God, to offer ourselves to God. We're choosing to delight in God because we believe that God is better, that he's satisfying, and ultimately that he is for our good. Like trees, we don't grow in a week. Weeds do that. Weeds grow in days, but trees take a lifetime. So it is with you and I. It takes constant, regular, unseen devotion to God for us to be rooted in him. It takes the heart attitude of delighting and loving and treasuring God to be a rooted person. So my question to you, will you choose the life of the rooted person? Delight in the word and meditate on it day and night. God, we come before you in prayer, and I pray, Lord, first of all, that I would be the first one in our church, Lord, that I would be a rooted person, that I would come to your word with eagerness and with excitement, with love, believing that it is good, that it is for me, that in it I find life and I find your son who is the exact imprint of you. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you that it points us to Jesus. Thank you that it shows us the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you, Lord, that it, it presents us this choice where we can live and choose to, to love you. God, I pray that you would make this church a deep church, that we wouldn't be shallow, that we wouldn't have roots that only sit on rocks, but Lord, that our roots would go deep, that we would be connected to streams of water, that our fruit would bear, um, that would be, be born in season, and that our leaves would not wither. Lord, that we would endure hard times, that we would always be connected to the life-giving water of your word. God, our church is not as deep as the preacher. Our church is not as deep as our programs. Our church is not as deep as as much as we give away. Our church is as deep as the people who are rooted in it. So I pray, Lord, that you would root us deep. In your name we pray, amen.